Well, it's one o'clock. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Kevin Murphy. I'm chair of the Humanities Department here at the University of the Sciences, and I'm very pleased to celebrate the bicentennial of the University of the Sciences, 200 years in 2021. We also mark the 20th year of the Mischer Festival and the Mischer uh, Visiting Professor, events which commemorate former University President Alan Mischer's vision of an undergraduate education that embraces history, philosophy, literature, alongside of biology, chemistry, and more. The Department of Humanities and the Mischer College of Arts and Sciences at U Sciences have long provided students with the foundation of their education. Today's program particularly exemplifies the vision of the medical humanities undergraduate major at U Sciences. Jenna Kwasinski, one of our medical humanities major <clears throat> who is currently in medical school, is also an award-winning writer. Many, of, many other of our graduates uh, have gone on to uh, distinguished features uh, of, of their writing careers. The ideal student for our medical humanities major would be someone like Dr. Sherry Fink, our 2021 Mischer Visiting Professor in Humanities. The title of today's event is The COVID-19 Lottery and Medical Humanities, a conversation with Dr. Sherry Fink on medical ethics, pandemic preparedness, and investigative journalism during the times of COVID-19. Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and physician, Dr. Sherry Fink is currently one of the nation's most active journalists reporting on COVID-19, as well as the executive producer <clears throat> of the 2020 Netflix documentary series, Pandemic. She earned both her MD and PhD at Stanford University. For many years, Dr. Fink has worked as a correspondent for the New York Times. In 2020, she reported on the COVID-19 outbreak. Previously, her New York Times stories on the West Africa Ebola crisis were recognized with the 2015 Pulitzer Prize for international reporting. Her story, The Deadly Choices at Memorial, co-published by ProPublica and the New York Times Magazine, received a 2010 Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting and a National Magazine Award for reporting. That story expanded to become her book, Five Days at Memorial, Life and Death at a Storm-Ravaged Hospital. This book narrates the harrowing account of five days at New Orleans Memorial Hospital in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. That book won the National Book Critics Circle Award and the Penn John Kenneth Galbraith Award, Los Angeles Times Book Prize, American Medical Writers Association Medical Book Award, and many others. Today, Dr. Sherry Fink will be interviewed by U Sciences Professor of English, Christine Flanagan. Professor Flanagan is a longtime U Sciences faculty member who has received the Lindback Award for Distinguished Teaching, the, Pat the Patricia Leahy Award for Teaching Innovation, and the William F. Homeller Award for Teaching Excellence. Her scholarship includes the book, The Letters of Flannery O'Connor and Carolyn Gordon. She is faculty advisor for the Elixir, the U Sciences undergraduate literary journal that has published student writers alongside U.S. poet laureates. Some of those writers are in our audience today. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us and I'd like to offer our warmest welcome to Dr. Sherry Fink. Thank you. <laughs> Christine, I think you need to unmute, please. Thank you, and we begin. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, just a word before we begin our conversation with Dr. Fink today, uh, you may submit questions through the Q&A function here in the webinar. Uh, Cindy Hong will be helping me share your questions for Dr. Fink at the end, uh, toward the end of our session here today. So if you'd like to ask questions about her work, her writing, please feel free to do that. Um, Sarah Robinson is also live in the chat box. So if you have any general questions uh, throughout today's event, uh, go right ahead and submit them through the chat box. If you'd, um, uh, a brief note, I should say, as we begin this conversation with Dr. Fink as well, we are speaking on January 21st, 2021, mid-pandemic, one day after the inauguration of President Biden. I can guarantee that some of the ideas we state, some of the opinions we hold today will shift and change. Uh, the statistics we quote will change by tonight. So uh, this is a recommendation from your friendly teacher to check your most current facts and statistics and uh, to forgive us as our 
own opinions shift and change. Um, welcome, Dr. Sherry Fink. Thank you so much. Uh, can I ask where you're joining us from? I'm joining you from Los Angeles, um, where I'm um, doing another what we're, we call hospital embed. So spending time um, at a hospital, trying to understand more about the coronavirus surge that's happening here in Southern California. So I'm at an Airbnb and um, I just wanna pivot off of something you just said, which is uh, that concept about how things change, how opinions change, how, how expert advice changes. And we've certainly seen that over the course of this pandemic there have been so many twists and turns with this virus, so many things that we're learning. And in fact, I think change is a good thing. Sometimes we're seeing that as a, as a problem. Um, it's hard as public, uh, particularly people who aren't medical or aren't scientific in, in background to understand why you know, recommendations change a lot. But I think that's actually a good thing if science uh, you know, guides us in that. And certainly I remember starting medical school being told, you know, like uh, half of the things you're reading in your textbook won't be true in 10 years. And uh, I, that's true of a lot of things. It's so good to remember that. And, and as I mentioned, you know, with today being the day it is, uh, things will change by tonight. We'll, we'll, we'll have different information tonight. Um, preparing for this event though, um, and I did want to give a little more context um, for um, those who, have taken a break from the news lately, but preparing for this event, I could not help but think of the short story by Shirley Jackson called The Lottery, which is why I titled this event with the word The Lottery in it. Uh, it's a short story published in 1948, right after World War II. And in the story, for those of you, most of you are familiar with the story, a fictional small town comes together for an annual lottery and the winner uh, receives a, a public stoning to death. Um, it's a story about following blind tradition, but it also reminds me of our flatlined response to the horror of daily statistics. Um, we begin this afternoon. Um, one year ago today, doctors identified the first COVID-19 patient in Seattle, Washington, in the United States. That was one year ago today. Um, March 31st uh, last year, the CDC reported 32 cases of COVID-19 and some were estimating upwards of 28,000 unreported um, cases. Today, um, there are over 24 million cases in the United States and 406,000 deaths to date. I say these things, and, and as I say these things, I also want to, um, I want to have an uplifting conversation and a really positive conversation today. But I, but I do think about the frontline medical workers. I think about my students who are among them. And when I read your reporting, Dr. Fink, I'm, I'm so grateful for the work that you do, helping to show us what is happening in these arenas, not just the numbers, but the human stories the context and the consequence of choices. So uh, just to reiterate what Kevin Murphy said, uh, we are honored to have you as our Misher Visiting Professor of Humanities here today. Thank you so much. Um, I did wanna ask- It's an honor to be here. <laughs> I did wanna ask today if you, if you wanted to open our conversation by reading a brief passage from your work. Um, um, an article you published, it was back in 2009 in the New York Times and ProPublica. There was an article uh, that really um, catapulted your work as a writer in many ways. It was an article called The Deadly Choices at Memorial. It won the Pulitzer Prize. It was expanded into the book Five Days at Memorial, which tells the story of a five-day period after Hurricane Katrina at Memorial Medical Center in New Orleans. So, would you read an excerpt from that book for us? And would you mind telling me what you think rereading this work um, all these years later? Sure. I, I want to just say what all of you do is important too. And uh, the, the job of teaching and learning right now um, couldn't be more difficult given all of these 
challenges, so keep it up. Um, so I'll read you this brief passage. At a recent national conference for hospital disaster planners, Dr. Anna Poe asked a question. How long should healthcare workers have to be with patients who might not survive? The story of Memorial Medical Center raises other questions. Which patient should get a share of limited resources and who decides? What does it mean to do the greatest good for the greatest number? And does that end justify all means? Where is the line between appropriate comfort care and mercy killing? How, if at all, should doctors and nurses be held accountable for their actions in the most desperate of circumstances, especially when their government fails them? So um, that was about a hospital surrounded by water, um, power failed, and uh, people waiting days and days for rescue. A very dire situation, a modern American hospital without power uh, in the heat after a hurricane. So, but, um, but I remember being struck as I was writing the story uh, that you described and later the book about what happened after that and the choices that were made, that the, the first question uh, just about like who to rescue first, that that was a question of uh, triage that had analogies in so many things. I mean, it's like philosophically goes back to, you know, Aristotle's, um, you know, uh, writings and these questions of who gets the goods of society when there aren't enough or there's not perceived to be enough to go around. And of course, that's a question from time immemorial. Nobody's solved it yet, but uh, the, the, the choices, the practical decisions about how to prioritize do have life and death consequences when it comes to this medical arena. And, you know, it couldn't be more on everybody's minds now, just uh, the vaccines, for example, how, who, who gets them first? How is that decided? What, what values go into that? And um, who gets to make the decisions? All, all of that is very relevant. Uh, I remember coming out of writing that book thinking that there's no one right way to decide these questions um, or no one right answer, but that the process of making the decisions uh, also is very important. And that is something that we can control, can control in terms of making it more inclusive, making it transparent, um, you know, making sure that voices for, for smaller groups of people who have, um, you know, the potential of not being heard, but have very important concerns be heard. Um, one of the things I did last year was to follow some of the work um, just on a, like a federal governmental level, the Office of Civil Rights at the Health Department. The head of that was, was very passionate about ensuring that the rights of elders and people with disabilities were um, not forgotten at a time when hospitals were talking about rationing ventilators. And for years that had, that had been sort of a, an exercise that was done. There was even some federal money. If your state or your hospital comes up with a plan for a pandemic, it was usually the scenario running out of ventilators in a respiratory pandemic, because this was not, um, what we're experiencing now was very well foreseen by a lot of experts. And um, so there were, a lot of these copycat plans that kind of had certain rigid inclusion criteria, who could qualify for even being admitted to a hospital during a surge in infections, um, let alone get into an intensive care unit or be on a ventilator. And a lot of them didn't really think about these groups of people potentially facing discrimination. Um, and there's been a lot more, um, what's the word, um, like, comp mm, a deeper thinking about these and revision of these in the light of the pandemic, that's, that's been a very good thing, I think. So that's a long answer to your question, <laughs> but thank you for, thank you for uh, starting us off this way. Um, what you just spoken about reminds me of um, the article you published last year with Mike Baker, uh, while you've been reporting on COVID-19 for the New York Times, and I encourage everyone to um, Google and check out the work you've done for the New York Times, which is extraordinary. And it's extraordinary the amount of space they've given um, for a writer like you to 
be able to expand these stories. Um, last March, you published an article, exactly what you're talking about now, titled, At the Top of the COVID-19 Curve, How Do Hospitals Decide Who Gets Treatment? And you wrote this about the issues facing our hospitals. Quote, the plans struggle to address a range of ethical issues and also matters of social equality. People with underlying medical conditions, medical problems may get ranked lower, yet low income people and people of color often have more health problems because they cannot afford top notch care. And so I'm just amazed at how you're, you have reported and continue to report things that, that um, we see around us and we, we see um, these issues either ignored or people struggling with them. But, but you're re because your reporting is looking at the moments where regional and national healthcare systems become overwhelmed, you, you get to show us in your writing the consequences for being unprepared. Um, and I, I really, I found the um, docu-series Pandemic, Pandemic on Netflix um, fascinating and disturbing that it came out just before COVID-19 appeared on our radar. Um, but the consequences for being unprepared are ruthless. Um, frontline workers, like you said, are forced to make these choices. Who gets a ventilator? Um, when you talk about distribution of vaccines, who gets one, right? But what I'm really struck by in your writing that there is a question beneath that question. The question of who gets a ventilator or who gets a vaccine is a question of who chooses who gets a ventilator or who gets a vaccine. And I, I've seen that throughout your reporting. Mike, I guess my question for you is, um, did, was that a deliberate choice that you came to that kind of a focus in your reporting? Did it just emerge naturally out of the act of reporting? Um, but what I see again and again in your writing is this focus on human choices and consequences, as opposed to reporting, we're just a bunch of passive victims in a natural disaster, or we're just, we're just a bunch of passive victims in a pandemic your reporting continues to focus on what choices humans make. How did you come to find that as a focus in your writing? It, it probably did come out of focusing on these crisis situations. Uh, at first, after medical school, I, I took a year off. That's what I'm still on. And um, But I, was, I got into humanitarian aid work almost by accident. It's, it's, it's a whole story in itself, but that meant going to, um, you know, a flood in Mozambique or, uh, you know, the Iraq war, um, you know, with an aid organization after there was, um, you know, health facilities that were destroyed and needing to resupply them. It meant going to Katrina actually as a, a volunteer at first, but um, the book and the article came out years later. So, uh, but seeing that over and over again, really reinforces this idea that we are inevitably less than perfectly prepared. Um, and so I guess I, I, and then also seeing the power of the individual, even in those very imperfect contexts to either save lives or, um, you, you know, to like really have an impact, it, usually for the positive, if you do that kind of work. Um, and it's just like now where we're, we're seeing just in, incredible acts of human resilience and bravery and heroism, unfortunately, like you don't want so many heroes, you don't want to have them, but but people really do rise to that occasion. And so that question of like, um, yes, there's a huge amount of importance to uh, investigative journalism and other types of accountability work that look at these larger structures and how to, um, the, the ounce of prevention part and how to have structures that are more resilient and that don't put us into these terrible situations of having to choose. But inevitably, or almost inevitably, there will be something imperfect, even the best prepared response, there will be something new about a particular crisis that takes you by surprise. And so the individual, we, all of us have to operate within that 
And so I, I think it's just very interesting to look at. So then how do we prepare ourselves to be um, the best we can on game day? Is there some muscle memory that we can develop um, both our, you know, like um, kind of like ethically, our ethical frameworks that will prepare us to make really tough choices where there aren't great options um, or our, you know, our skills-based um frameworks, I suppose. And so the idea of writing these stories is for us to have the chance to walk through this mentally, hopefully before we ever have to face it in reality. So it seemed like there's some value in that. And then they always say for, for all of you who are studying writing or teaching writing, but you like if you follow your own curiosity and passion as somebody who's preparing to write something, I mean, even if it's for a class, that that's a good sign that other people will be interested in it as well. And so those are some of the, the reasons to look at those issues. Uh, I'm gonna ask you just a follow up there question because you mentioned writing, of course. Um, where, um, who taught you writing? Why, why do you think you chose writing? Oh, wow. Well, I, I've always loved it. I've just been, I was one of those little kids that love telling stories. I have a younger brother and I would, I remember at night, I would ask him to give me like um, names of people or what whatnot. And then I would make a little story out of it. And I, from the time I can remember, I would write little books and as a kid, so I just, I just loved writing. I loved reading. Um, my favorite classes, my favorite teachers were English class. And, um, and, and my dad was a, a, a journalist early on in his career. And I kind of enjoyed going with him to the newspaper and sitting in on the news meetings where they decided what the stories of the day were going to be. So I, I loved all of that stuff. And I, I remember, um, though being warned into you know, like, no, like uh, you have to pick a career where you know you can support yourself. And that's that's not, how many of you listening here were told that by your parents? <laughs> um, so I, I, but I also became very, very interested in medicine and thought very much, I didn't go into that thinking that I wouldn't practice medicine. I, quite the opposite, I, I was really into, medicine and science and research and thought that I would have an academic medical career. So that was a surprise. And for all of you who are students who think you have to plot out the perfect career path that sometimes um, you end up having opportunities. And if you have the good fortune to be able to follow your passion or your outrage, I should say, and things that really seem like you want to you know, that you could apply something from yourself to a problem that, uh, that really intrigues you and outrages you, Th that's a great way to be able to live. And I've been very fortunate to have those types of opportunities. And when I took that year off from um, after medical school before continuing my training, just ended up on a path and uh, it's led me to where I am today. So, but I did put a lot of effort into learning how to write. I, I think the other part of your question was that. So when you go to medical school and especially, yeah, med school and grad school, and you're asked to write these very technical papers, it's, uh, you're almost told to write poorly. <laughs> the, um, the, the things you learn about what is good writing in terms of uh, literature are, sometimes the opposite of what you're doing. And so I think I'm still in the process of being uh, by great editors helping me undo that, that tendency. But uh, I remember when I started writing that I, I put as much attention to learning how to do that, to practicing that as medicine. I, I mean, that sounds weird, or maybe it doesn't actually, if you, if you are a, a writer. Um, and I still find it very, very hard. To, um, to write. I'm not a particularly fast writer, um, but I like that. I like the challenge, but it's painful. I know we'll have more questions um, during the Q&A about writing and writing tricks and writing tips, that's for sure. Um, uh, I'm gonna jump back to your reporting though, again, and I, I wanted to ask you um, about your, 
one of the, the other things I see you focus on in your reporting is um, your attention to creative solutions and problem solving. Uh, you mentioned this a little bit earlier in our, in our talk here today. Um, if opportunity is the flip side of failure, and I, I think it is, what have you learned about creativity in solving the problems that you've reported about? And um, can you describe any times you've seen some unusual creative problem solving? Have you ever accidentally or intentionally been trained or learned about creative problem solving? Oh yeah, I highly recommend creative problem solving. And that, that is the thing, if you can stay alive to that possibility that there aren't just the options that there seem to be in front of you, especially when you're faced with something that feels like a tragic decision where you're not gonna be fully happy however you choose it, um, finding another way out, uh, a way that might expand resources through the application of creativity is, is a good thing and can often solve some of these problems. And so, um, gosh, I can think of a bunch just going on right now. So we're, we're having discussions, national discussions about this flow vaccine rollout and what is it that can be done to, um, to hasten it. And so some of the creative thinking, not necessarily um, correct or uh, ways that we're going to go, but there, there's discussion of, you know, could you do half a dose? Can you delay a second dose? Um, these are the types of thinking that I'm talking about, exploring all those options, not getting necessarily locked into what, what first appears to be the, um, you know, a limit. Um, and I think Americans are very good at thinking beyond limits, um, questioning limits, and to me, that, that can be very helpful in these situations. And, and then with the ventilators too, um, there was, and, and there is, again, in America, it's, a, it's very, for those of us who um, either are from other places or, or travel, look at other places, think this is a, like a good quality of Americans. This idea that like, we, we will not ration, rationing is horrible, the R word, um, which is good, like you don't, want to be denied something that if, if you could have it, if you could give it to more people, people could survive. And so I remember when that, uh, and I'm sure a lot of us do, last spring when it really, the virus was taking off where I live in New York, the fear was that it was going to soon be like that everywhere at the same time. And um, fortunately, it wasn't, but uh, it, there was this limited number of ventilators. This was a problem well known before the pandemic. And, uh, but there was a, this idea of like, all right, we will start building more. We will, you know, explore, can you use one ventilator for two people? Is that possible? Um, just lots of creative thinking going into that. And ultimately also this idea that is now much more prevalent, not only because of the shortage, but it turned out to be a good thing medically, it seems, which is to try to use other forms of supporting breathing before putting somebody on a ventilator. So those are some examples. And, and then you're making me think even just last night, I was at the hospital until like 3 a.m. following a particular patient's journey. And, um, and uh, there, there was this issue, this hospital ran out of ICU space and um, they were having ICU patients kind of tucked around the hospital. And then they made this big move about one or two weeks ago and they took over a whole floor, but this floor wasn't meant to be an intensive care unit. And so the nurses kind of need to see the patients through the doors, but then they also wanted some protection against the virus. This is a long story short, they um, put these plastic sheets over the, the doors but the plastic, they couldn't see through it. And so the other night they were like cutting holes, um, little windows and using like little pieces of plastic so that they could see through. I mean, th this kind of like just uh, winging it, uh, thinking creatively, coming up with solutions. It's hap it happens all the time in, in emergencies. And so the extent to which you, as you um, are thinking about what kind of crises could, could happen, just like remembering that idea of like, can I stop? Can I just stop for a moment and um, think really deeply about the situation and whether there might be other options, I think is a good 
a good skill to develop and very hard when you're under stress and maybe haven't slept enough. When you're under that kind of stress too, I, I remember you were reported, I think it was an article you um, published in December. Um, one, one example you used was from Mogadishu, I think where um, there was a COVID hospital, they had no ICU and they had no basic fever medicine at this location. And so they brought in, was it industrial oxygen? Um, they had no medical oxygen. Um, that was a really yeah, interesting. They created, they created this contraption. So they, the hospital itself had no uh, piped oxygen. So at first, you know, when you think about an intensive care unit, and we're even hearing about it here in California a, few, a couple of weeks ago about shortages of oxygen and how much oxygen critically ill COVID patients require. And at this hospital in Mogadishu, which was you know, designated for COVID care, they had no formal oxygen, like you'd have to have a tank if you needed it. And so, yeah, they thought really creatively, they hired a contractor and um, there was this, this row of these huge oxygen tanks, industrial oxygen, and then a welder had come and like, there's actually a picture in the story, I think, of the contraption. Actually, I'm not, I'm not sure if that made it in um, and just created like this piping system. Um, and it almost, I think, uh, I compared it to a Rube Goldberg machine, but it looked like this contraption and somehow that was piped into the hospital. And then there would be um, a contractor on site at all times, like for looking for that next tank to go out and replacing it. And they were being able to do this makeshift piping system, um, which isn't ideal. And there are better solutions that they're hopefully going to get to, but that's how they are supporting life right now. And in another, you reported in another instance, um, I teach creativity, so I love, I love these examples. Um, you, um, reported that sort of outside of the medical environment, I forget which country it was in Africa, that the um, one country had prohibited alcohol sales because they realized there would be a drop in car accidents to this one. Yes, and in fact, they recently restarted that. So that was South Africa, which has been by far the hardest hit country uh, on the continent. And uh, they did that early on. They had a surge in cases early in the pandemic and the hospitals were really overwhelmed and yeah, stopping alcohol sales, the, the traumatic injuries from car accidents and also from interpersonal violence really dropped off. And as you might've heard, just there's been a, a like a more, these more transmissible strains. There was, is one in South Africa that is accounting for the vast majority of cases they again had a huge surge in the last few weeks and they've, re, um, they've, they've imposed that ban on the alcohol sales again, just because again, the hospitals are so overwhelmed. I, I wonder, Christine, are, are there some things you could tell us about um, how to maintain creativity in, in a crisis? Um, like, are there some, can I, can I, may I ask you a question? I, um... I think creativity is essentially problem solving. So any opportunity you have to solve a problem, whether the problem is a blank page or you know, an exercise in front of you where you don't know the answer, where there's nine dots in front of you and you have to use four lines to connect it. I was really struck last year, I heard the story of the astronauts who I forget which, which spacecraft it was, I apologize. Um, and there was a leak and they had to figure out where the leak was. And, the process they went through and sort of shutting down the different rooms and then realizing uh, the astronauts realized that if they just opened up a tea bag and watched the tea leaves over time, that the tea leaves slowly go toward the leak, the place where the oxygen was leaking out. Into, I just love stories like this where um, we're faced with um, a problem that you um, can look at the world that's immediately around you and pick up anything around you. Um, as long as you know, you know, that's that expression, like thinking outside of the box, right? As long as you know, um, oh, maybe I can solve this by calling in contractors with industrial oxygen. I don't need to call a medical supplier or 
Um, so I love these kind of problems. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah, I, I just love even that first thing you said about how it how it's essentially problem solving. I hadn't thought about it that way. That's brilliant. Thank you. Not my not my brilliant, but um, but I, but I but I'm fa- because I'm a creative writer. I'm fascinated by, of course, writing, but also this idea that um, um, how how agile we can be. And uh, one of my favorite um, people who writes on um, on creativity is a is a previous Michigan visiting professor named Keena Lesky, and she's an architect. And, and her architectural background brings her to say that one of the things that really makes us creative is to embrace the limitations around us, that it's the limitations that force us into agility. Without those limitations, if you say to me, oh, go write a book, you have unlimited time, you'll never solve the problem. But the minute you are given the constraint of time, space, um, life or death, things can happen. And so, um, but I'm, I'm just fascinated by that. And, I, and again, I see this all over the place um, in your reporting um, of, of the pandemic, of, you know, sort of what was going on through uh, Hurricane Katrina, through natural disasters. Um, we, um, we have a little bit of time. I think I'm going to ask you uh, one more main question before we get to sort of opening it up to um, the audience for questions and answers. So again, if anyone would like to ask Dr. Fink a question, uh, try using the Q&A box. Um, and while we wait for some questions to come in, um, you, you mentioned the classroom. We're in the classroom. I've been in the classroom by and large remotely since last March. Um, talk about creative problem solving, right? Um, well, and sometimes I just want to say to people like you, like, what should I teach my students? You mentioned you mentioned Aristotle, which is so refreshing, by the way. Um, what 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 should our priorities be? And obviously, this is your opinion, but your opinion as a as a front lines reporter, as a doctor, and also speaking of creative problem solving, how can we at a place like University of the Sciences, the faculty, the administration, the staff, how can we be forces that contribute to solutions as the pandemic continues or as natural disasters, as, as you know, the, as climate change, uh, we're faced with what will come next there. What, what should I teach my students or what, what might you offer uh, to us? What, what can we do? I don't know if that's um, yeah I love I love that you're making me think of a few things well one of them is like again for students who are figuring out where to apply your talents and your um your interests I think one of the things is like there isn't one good cause or problem <laughs> to solve there's so many and and I feel like if all of us if each of us were able to be able to focus on one or a few things that uh that that's that that's great and so don't feel like you have to um I don't know find the perfect thing or that there's just like one really important problem because there's there are a lot of them there are enough to go around so so just keeping that in mind um and another thing I I think you, you made me think of with that question is just this question both in the sciences and also in terms of I guess it bridges the, the sciences, the medical sciences and communication and, and journalism and, and, and creative forms of writing. But this question of um, that we're facing of, of um, these questions around what truth is and, and uh, um, what, what, what's referred to a lot as anti-science or um, questioning of science, um, which, which can be a good thing, right? Like to, to question. But I think I wonder if if uh, students might have some creative thinking just because you've grown up in this current communications world that a lot of us older people aren't native to. And so what is it that could help um, get 
get people more on the same page and not have radically different views of truth? Um, or how, how do we bridge that? Um, how to help people? I, I, I don't know. It's just like, it's such a mystery. And I'm a person who's communicating a lot and who's seeing like, I'm seeing the worst of what this disease can do because I'm mostly in my reporting focusing on critically ill or very sick people in hospitals. And it's just like astonishing to me. It's astonishing to, and, and very disheartening to the staff of these hospitals who are risking their lives every day, going in and seeing like, gosh, this 30 year old yesterday, there was somebody in their late twenties who was like critically ill and nobody understood why that was. But, but the fact that that exists and then that there are people who don't think the virus is a problem. So how, like, <laughs> I don't know, you know, I don't even know exactly what I'm asking, but if, what if you as a professor got your students to think about, well, in writing, is there a way to bring people together or help, I, I don't know, help solve this problem of having radically different versions of, of truth uh, in this country right now? Um, that, that would be one of them. Yeah. Okay, good. I'll, I'll, I'm on it. Okay. <laughs> We're on it. <laughs> Nothing. Just, we'll figure out, right? Um, let me know <laughs> what the... Uh, I will. I will. All right. I'll let you know. My, my students will let you know. Um, I'm going to ask for uh, Cindy Han to help me out now with um, some Q&A from the audience. And Cindy is uh, remarkably, uh, has been accepted to some MD PhD programs. Congratulations, Cindy. Congrats. She's a great writer. Yes, she is. And so, um, Cindy, what, what do we have for our audience from, uh, for Dr. Fain? So one of the first questions we have um, was about your book, um, Five Days at Memorial. Um, the first question was, how did you deal with the emotions that must have come with researching and writing this book? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I think that that can be a broader question of if you are writing about traumatic subjects, whether you're a memoirist delving into your past or you're an investigative journalist looking into upsetting events. Uh, it, it's just, I guess, really important to acknowledge that that, is, uh, that, that can be difficult. And um, so I, I remember thinking a lot about the fact that the people who went through what I was writing about were, you know, I, I don't know, maybe it's sort of being inspired by, you know, if they can do it, if they can get through this, um, that, that that's a positive thing and uplifting. Um, and I don't know, sometimes maybe it's okay to be really, really sad about writing about sad things and making sure that you have support and um, acknowledge that it's it's real and, and can be um, hard. This is talked about for, for journalists who write about war, for example, that they can sometimes be traumatized by being in those traumatic situations. And so, um, very deserving of support and there's that culture of macho and um, denying that you have a, you know, a problem. So uh, I think it's generally acknowledged that it's very important to, to recognize that trauma, not only in others, but um, to, to follow the same sort of um, uh, advice that we, that we would write about that that is given to others. And I'm just thinking of one resource that is particularly good. Um, it's the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma. And it has resources for reporting sensitively on traumatic situations, not adding to the problems of people. Um, but I think it also really acknowledges that some practitioners of that type of journalism will also be exposed to uh, upsetting things and and so like tools to to deal with that so thank you for the question 
Absolutely. Um, I think that's definitely really helpful for students who are considering going into writing, especially if they want to merge their um, medical or healthcare education with the writing that they do. Um, the next question I have is, what are the most important takeaways you have learned in your years of research in healthcare resource allocation? Um, it's, I just want to flick back to that last question. I, I looked over at my phone, which I have muted, and then there's a text there about this patient who I've been following and his family and that he just passed away. So that, that's a good example of, I felt very sad in that moment. Um, so in, in terms of the, the question about um, the lessons, the big takeaways from the, this resource allocation question, I, I think it really is the most important takeaway is something that we've touched on, which is that the process of making those decisions matters. So it means having people in the room who can represent uh, what is known in the lingo as stakeholders, but the people who could be affected by those uh, decisions that should have a voice in them. It shouldn't just be the experts in um, you know, medicine, for example, that make a choice about how, um, how medical resources will be allocated because that's something we all have a stake in. And I mean, it, it's interesting to think about the fact that um, right now that there's almost universal agreement that the healthcare workers should have the first vaccines. And it, it's interesting because the years before this pandemic, when there was a lot of thinking about the, um, a related question, which is these ventilator allocation questions, who should have access to ventilators if they aren't, if there aren't enough to go around, there was this question of whether health workers should be prioritized. And it, it was actually a controversial one. It wasn't just assumed that, well, yes, of course they should have the first access. Um, on, and there were different ethical um, and equity arguments about that. On the one side, it was, you know, these people are putting themselves on the line, taking an extra risk. So shouldn't society reward them if they do become sick in their jobs? Um, wouldn't it be right for them to have uh, that? Another would be like a practical argument. Well, if we um, tell health workers that they'll have priority access to something that could save their lives, will that make more of them be willing to take the risk and show up to do their work in a pandemic, which is super important. But the, then there were other arguments that actually went against it. Um, one was, well, if the health workers are the ones distributing that resource, should they, in fact, um, you know, would it look like they're just looking out for themselves? And what about all these other essential workers who are also risking their lives? And why wouldn't they also have a priority access? Why should it just be health workers? Is it because health workers are making these decisions? And another was a little more um, utilitarian. Uh, it, it was something like, well, if they're if they get really sick during peak pandemic surge, by the time that they would be off the ventilator and be able to like go back to work, um, that surge would have passed. And so therefore they shouldn't be prioritized because they won't be of use in the, in the short term in a pandemic. So there, it's just to say that there are a lot of, um, a lot of arguments that are worth considering when you make these choices. And, uh, also that there might be really important local context. And that's why we're seeing now, for example, with um, vaccine allocation, that it's it's kind of comes down to a local authority to make some decisions on that and not, not just imposed from above. And there's some important reasons for that because um, even questions of equity or potential bias or whatnot um, could have different local contexts. But it, it's hard, like there's no one right way, but I do think uh, you know, my takeaways would be like transparency and inclusiveness are really important aspects of the procedural justice piece of that. Um, and there's a, a field in um, academics that you could look at called deliberative democracy, where um, it's, it's about kind of bringing the public together, using uh, um, um, like a moderated day long deliberative process to come to some um, sense of, of these types of, of really difficult questions that could face a community. And I, I was kind of intrigued by that process and there 
was a bit of work uh, using those techniques to um, to think through these ventilator allocation decisions over in, in recent years. And some interesting things came out of that, but it's, it's still in the end, you're that creativity piece is also super important. And, and we find that very often, um, if you allow yourself to not just look at that, how do we um, rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic, but you actually think about how you might prevent the ship from going down, that in fact, you can avoid having to implement some of these awful, awful choices, sometimes, often. Yeah, and to kind of follow up on that, um, I think that um, based on what you said, it's becoming clear that within medicine and healthcare, um, the role of a physician or a healthcare provider goes beyond just providing um, health and providing that um, treatment to patients. So how do we, how does the um, field of education for healthcare professionals change moving forward um, due to the pandemic and due to natural disasters? Um, how do you teach physicians to go outside of the box of just providing healthcare treatment? Yeah, well, th there's lots of reasons that 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 it, that the education should go beyond that, right? Um, and I think that yeah, the pandemic will definitely. Um, I think there had been a a struggle to incorporate just uh, emergency preparedness into medical education. It was increasingly being recognized that our healthcare infrastructure was very vulnerable to a variety of different types of disasters from um, not only infectious disease uh, threats, um, which was, I think, really brought home by the Ebola, um, the, the big Ebola outbreak in 2014, 2015 in West Africa, when a few cases came to the US and we thought we were invulnerable and some uh, nurses got caught the virus. Um, so from that to the hurricane scenario, increased coastal um, weather, you know, severe weather. And just, I mean, I remember when I went through med school, I don't think we thought much about those issues at all, but how do you, how do you operate in, a, in an extreme context and still be able to provide care? So the importance of that will certainly be undermined, uh, undermined underlined and maybe undermined by the pandemic. And I'm sure there will be a whole generation of people your, your age and your, your generation that will um, have come up through this period and be formed by it and contribute brilliant solutions and ideas to the future of this field. So, um, so that's, a, that's a really good thing. And um, you'll, you'll have things to teach us to teach others because you're entering uh, at, at a time where the health um, infrastructure is, is really stressed and where we see those holes in our preparedness and ways that we could do better. What, one of the other principles that I really like when it comes to preparedness and hospitals is this idea of a dual use idea. So um, things that can make everyday medicine better that we, that help in emergencies. Um, I mean, the, like one that comes to mind since we were talking about oxygen, but there are different forms of oxygen generation that are more efficient and that also tend to be more robust in disasters. Um, and so I remember that that's like one of the things that have, um, when you talk about the architecture, uh, kind of applications to um, preparedness and to healthcare, that is, is one, but one of many examples. Thank you. Um, so our next question is under, so the context is that under um, normal conditions and under the pandemic, um, healthcare providers often have to work long shifts and suffer from sleep deprivation. Um, do you think this is something that needs to be addressed given critical problem solving that is needed by these professionals? Yes, <laughs> it's a long-standing issue and it, it comes up every certain number of years. And uh, if you learn the history of medicine, so key cases, the Libby Zion case in New York, that ended up limiting the trainees hours. 
so that people could get sleep and make better decisions. And Five Days at Memorial, the book we talked about, the Hurricane Katrina book, was a very good example of how critical thinking skills really degenerate when people haven't had a lot of sleep. And I think those who are drawn to the caring professions, you just like, you're in a crisis and you want to work, work, work and help, help, help. And it's easy to forget that you need to stop and sleep and take care of yourself to be able to help others. And that's really important. And so those of you who get to be in like management roles, who can um, almost create a structure that forces people to take breaks, that's super important. Um, and it's important for all of us to remember that our you know, our brains work best if we can take breaks. Um, and, and it's hard, it's hard. You know, I talked to these, um, I think one of the, the key takeaways from the pandemic, and I think a lot of us feel this way, right, is, is that people working with the sickest uh, COVID patients in intensive care, where they're seeing a lot of death, that they just like fighting so hard to save these lives and people are dying at very high rates once they're a, a certain level of critical illness. And um, the nurses talk about having to function during their shifts, obviously, but then going home and like seeing the faces and um, hearing the voices of people who, because very often these are pretty healthy people who are sitting there talking to you until they need to be intubated. And then like a day later, they're dead. And you're remembering what that, patient said to you, that human being, and having made a connection with them or getting to know their families. So that can really interfere with sleep, even if the, the shifts are being kept at a reasonable number. And often during a surge, people are picking up extra shifts and they're literally like working a 12 hour shift, going home, falling asleep, coming back or not falling asleep. And so, yes, all I can say is that it's it's very important. And I don't know fully what the solution is, except to really recognize that um, that sleep is important and try to find ways to enhance it. Thank you so much, Cindy. I wish we had time for many, many more questions. Um, when I opened today, I said that, um, you know, uh, things would change, facts and statistics would change. It's such a um, stark reminder for you to get that word in our, in our, during our conversation of the patient who was lost. I'm so sorry. Um, and it reminds me once again that, you know, we don't live in a world of statistics. We live in a world of humans. Um, I'm gonna end on this one question. Um, if there uh, a lesson that you've learned this past year, something that has helped you, um, most important lesson or just an everyday lesson um, that you could share with us, Dr. Fink? Oh gosh. Um, yeah, I, th I think the biggest lesson is just for us to um, be reminded to be kind to each other. Every day we might pass people in our daily goings on or past people, Zoom people, who um, who we might not imagine are having a hard time. And now we can really remember that. I think that that is true at all times, but it's a pretty fair bet that right now, just about everybody <laughs> is having some uh, out of the ordinary challenges. And if we can somehow focus on how, on being more compassionate to to others and to ourselves, trying to understand other points of view that may just baffle us, but but uh, being kind and remembering that we're all human and and stressed um, that would be that would be a good lesson. And I, I, mm, uh, sorry, uh, I agree. Uh, I was thinking the same thing with all the technology, all the scientific research, all the you know advancements, all the political things that need to happen, uh, kindness. Um, is really easy to do. I cannot thank you enough for taking the time out of your day, out of your writing, out of this uh, work you're doing, this really important work you're doing. Dr. Sherry Fink, thank you so much. And for our audience, I encourage you 
to watch the Netflix docuseries Pandemic. Dr. Fink is one of the executive producers. To read uh, Dr. Fink's uh, Five Days at Memorial, U Sciences is hosting a book club event. If you'd like to join the book club discussion of the book, Five Days at Memorial, and to also look for her reporting in the New York Times and other news outlets. Thank you so much, Dr. Sherry Fink, for joining us today. Thank you. I, I want to say one last thing just to everybody, but um, uh, that act of kindness is an action. And I, I think we can all feel a little helpless too. And that that's really hard when there are these big problems. And